Good morning. On this Lord's Day, we are reminded of our wonderful Father in Heaven that together we have this unity in this greatest of all fathers. And he's really the author of everything that we think of as fatherhood. So we come to him now with confidence. Let's take a moment and uh, think about God as our great heavenly father. Amen. Well, our call to worship is from Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And our opening hymn is hymn 181. Now thank we all our God. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God the Father now be given, the Son and him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was is now, and shall be evermore. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we adore you for your Son, the great Lord Jesus Christ. He is now exalted on high, yet when he came, he came in, in a state of humiliation, a very low condition, and he did this for our sake. He emptied himself of his glory and took upon himself the form of a servant. And we see this humiliation, this low condition of Christ, not only in his conception and birth, but also in the sufferings of his life and then in his death on the cross and after his death and as he, he spent the time in the grave, his body resting in the grave, all the way up until his resurrection. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and our Savior, that he came for us and he humbled himself, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. And this was the one who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But this also was the same Lord Jesus Christ, even when he was at that very lowest point of death on the cross, he said to one who was near him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What an amazing God. We thank you, Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit, and we join together now in the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we need God's grace. We do because we're sinners and we don't shy away from that fact. But every time we look at one of the Ten Commandments or one of the other moral absolutes of God, we like to take a moment to consider what does it all mean? So these remarks now I'm reading to you were written by Dave Herod, and it's his meditation on Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. This commandment, maybe more than all the others, brings us face to face with the depth of our sin and the height of our salvation in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but when I've listened to someone speak about this commandment, I felt some measure of relief because I thought I was finally hearing a prohibition of something I had, hadn't actually done. And on some level, I was correct. The definition of murder, according to our government, is the intentional, unjustified killing of a human being. I have never done this. But in Matthew's Gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, we see that Jesus taught that even anger and hateful speech violate the commandment. Yes, even things like racism that are demeaning to human beings, they violate this commandment, thou shalt not murder. We might wonder how anger, how racism, how inconsiderate speech could be part of a commandment prohibiting murder. But our speech reflects what's going on in our hearts. And too often, it's certainly not love for our neighbor. We get an additional insight on this issue from something C.S. Lewis wrote. He said that good and evil both increase at, quote, compound interest, end quote. In other words, they build on each other. He gave the example of the Nazis in Germany. They hated the Jews, so they mistreated them. As they mistreated them, they hated them even more. As their hatred grew, the mistreatment became murder. On an individual level, think about the effect on the heart of someone indulging in hatred, self-righteous anger, and malice beginning in small ways but compounding that effect over eternity. See, we're participating in this worship service because all Christians become a part of God's covenant people through faith in Christ. A covenant is an agreement, but there are two important aspects of a covenant with God. The first is that God establishes the terms of the agreement. They aren't negotiated or, for that matter, negotiable. But the second and I think the, the most amazing difference is that God provides us with what we need to perform our part of the agreement. Frankly, we could never keep our part of the bargain without what we receive through the gift of faith in Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. An illuminated mind, a regenerated heart, and a changed will. The incredible good news is that God's plan for our salvation it's much more than making us a better version of what we are now, of making us a little less angry or a little less hateful, although that will certainly be one of the results through the work of the Spirit. He intends, though, to make us completely new, a completely new creation, literally children to be adopted into his family so we'll be sons of God through Christ our Lord, and we can participate in God's plan, even this morning, by recognizing the sin in our lives and changing our behavior. 
Who knows, the smallest act of love for a neighbor today may compound itself and advance us to a point in the future where incredible victories over sin may be possible. So that's a very good word for us to think about the relationship between anger against people and thou shalt not murder. So now together, let's confess our sins using the confession of sin in your order of worship based on the book of common worship. Let us confess together. Almighty God, you are rich in mercy to all those who call upon you. Hear us as we come to you, humbly confessing our sins and transgressions and imploring your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our deeds and by our words and by the sinful affections of our hearts. We confess before you our disobedience and ingratitude, our pride and willfulness, and all our failures and shortcomings toward you and toward our fellow men. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, and by your great goodness, Grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life through the merit and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And these words from Romans 5, verse 1, give us a, an assurance of God's pardon, and I use them today as a declaration of that pardon to all who would listen, who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. Hear these words. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Great words, Romans 5, 1, a wonderful assurance for us of the forgiveness of sins. Well, now let's turn to the Lord again in prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving and uh, intercession also looking for God's illuminating work in our hearts as we would hear his word. So let us pray. Father, once again, we come to you with thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you that we're a part of your eternal household, sons of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We want to thank you also for all who are in the body of Christ. Especially, we thank you for your son, who is king and head over that body and the cornerstone of the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we're grateful for that eternal family. We also thank you for the families that we grew up in and for any family life that we've experienced in this life that is mortal here on earth. We also want to thank you for the joy of family life in your church as we have brothers and sisters in Christ. But Father, we also want to remember the basics of life, that you give us everything that we need that our bodies and souls might be sustained. You give us food and water, air and sunshine, exercise and rest, self-discipline and trust. Lord, we know all of these things are important for us in our lives. So we want to thank you for every good gift, and we want to thank you also for the work of your word and spirit in our lives today. Father, we intercede for all those in our midst who are part of this wonderful adventure of fatherhood. Each of us remembers the father that you have granted to us or considers the fathers that we have had in our lives. But we want to also pray for those that we do not know, fathers that we have not seen, and for the general gift of fatherhood in our culture right now. We pray for aid for those who are wondering how to be fathers. Father, we also lift up to you specific people in our congregation that this very week have been suffering with sickness and challenging physical situations, surgeries, Lord, we also pray for those that have been lifted up by members of the congregation. 
So Lord, we think of Laura Lyman and Phyllis Longo and Steve Hamilton. And thank you, Father, for what you're doing, for the measure of recovery that you're giving to them. But we also want to pray for Dale Johnson, for Bill Speed, and for Grace Lewin. We think of Dale and Grace who are fighting the scourge of cancer now. And we pray, Father, that they would have much help from you and that you would bless the medical professionals that aid them. And then we think of our good friend and former member, Bill Speed, and his recent fall and the challenges that Bill faces from diabetes and difficulties of mobility. And we pray for future surgeries and for a return to much better health for Bill. We pray for his wife Beth and their family supporting Bill at this time. Lord, we turn to the churches in the Exeter area and we pray for a, a, a wonderful unity of the spirit in all the churches, particularly as more and more churches now are beginning to worship in person. So we pray as, the, as congregations feel safe enough to come back together, that you would bless the United Methodist Church, the Assemblies of God, Exeter Area Christian Fellowship, Regeneration Church of the, the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. And Father, we pray for First Baptist Church. And Lord, there are others as well in our region more generally. And we ask that you would grant to us all wisdom from your word, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and blessing upon blessing as we would hear your word read and preached. Also, Father, we think of the broader church beyond the borders of Exeter, and we think of Doug Warren serving in this very historic church in Vermont, in Woodstock, Vermont. We pray for that church as they are now together in worship again. We pray that you would grant them charity towards one another. Much blessing, Lord, as Doug would minister there in their midst. We pray for the Warren family, and we lift up to you especially Doug's father who suffers from dementia. We know that could be a strain on the family as they respect uh, this wonderful gift of uh, a grandfather and father. Yet, Father, we do pray that you would help them and supply patience and love and endurance so be with Doug and Kristen and all of their children. Father, we also think of those in, in far reaches, uh, long, long distances from us. In particularly this week, we prayed for the Nepalese churches and for that entire nation. We know that this very poor nation has faced much difficulty during this period of quarantine as they've tried to do what they felt to be right regarding the pandemic. And Lord, we know that the poverty situation is desperate for many. So we intercede on their behalf, and particularly we pray for Madan and for Gopal and the church, church movements that they represent as they try to care in the name of Christ for their fellow countrymen. Lord, now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would make the scriptures a lamp to our feet, and a light to our path. Lord, today we're going to read scripture. We're going to preach scripture. In the reading of the scripture, we pray that we would take this to our own hearts in hearing this word read from the Psalms, from the Sermon on the Mount, and from 1 Corinthians. We pray that we would be making our own applications. No, even better that your spirit would be making applications to our lives and that these would be useful then for our walk of faith in the week ahead. But especially as we turn to Isaiah and the preaching of the next chapter in Isaiah chapter 8, we pray that you would help your servant as he brings forward an exposition of this chapter and then also especially application of this chapter to our lives. So we pray, Lord, that you would do marvelous things through this word today. And we thank you for your mercies that you extend to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we turn our attention to our Bible readings today. 
And we continue in the Psalms today, Psalm 143, a Psalm of David. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Selah. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul. For I am your servant. Then turning to the Sermon on the Mount, to the Beatitudes. Now two verses that we have from Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And now we turn to 1 Corinthians 11. We finish up this chapter, verse 17 and beyond, with the discussion of the Lord's Supper. It says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another goes, gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. So just moving along as we are through Paul's epistles, we come to these various passages, and this one reminds us that it's been a long time since we've been able to eat that bread and drink that cup together. But we trust the Lord that at just the right time, that will happen and we'll, we'll be together again. In the meantime, we turn to Isaiah, this Old Testament prophet, and we have togetherness in the word. So that's a great gift for us to be able to open up this ancient book and to be able to gather for our hearts today by God's spirit good news for our own soul, for our own lives. So today we turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Hear God's word. Then the Lord said to me, take a large tablet and write on it in common characters belonging to Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah to, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me, not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary, and a stone of offense, and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony, 
If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So that's the word of God for us today from Isaiah. And the message that I have to you to give to you today is in, entitled Isaiah's Children. And the prophets had groups of people around them that uh, in the scriptures sometimes were called the sons of the, of the prophets. But also here in this chapter in Isaiah, we, we hear the very strange name of one of the actual children of Isaiah, and that name was given by God, and the name was Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, and this name means the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. Well, if you have prey, then you've got a predator, some animal running after you. If you've got spoil, you've got an army that's coming after you. God is saying here that danger is near. Isaiah was supposed to name his child accordingly. That's how near the danger was. Before that child was able to actually express himself with words that were understandable to mother and father, this would happen, that there would be great trouble coming against Israel and Judah. Why would this trouble be coming? We're not left to imagine. It's because God says this people has refused the waters of Shiloh. Shiloh means sending. And it's this water that God was sending to his people. It was actually a spring that was right near Jerusalem. It says here, this people... They refused that stream that God sent to them, that stream that flows so gently and provides water for them. What did they want instead? They wanted the big river that would come from far away, this greater stream. And, and God says, because you wanted what the Assyrians and the Syrians had for you, lo and behold, they're going to overflow your borders. It won't be a, a, a bubbling spring that feeds the city with fresh water gently coming forward. Instead, it will be an overwhelming deluge. Therefore, the king of Assyria's outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. That is what God says there. In Isaiah 8, he uses this word Emmanuel and he connects that to the land. He says it's the land of Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you'll remember from the previous chapter, means God with us. So this promised land that God gave to his children, this was the land of God with us. Now Isaiah has an initial reaction to these words that have come from the Almighty. He hears this, your land, O Emmanuel, and he says, that's good news. The promised land, this land, this is God's land, and God is with us. So whatever else God is saying here, he's still going to be with us, and at just the right moment, he's going to defend us, and we won't have problems from Syria and Israel, and we won't even have problems from the king of Assyria. So it was an overconfidence an overconfidence, just taking that one word, Emmanuel, and not thinking about how God was going to work out the promise of Emmanuel. We know now it would take centuries. Remember, we're in the 8th century BC right now. It would be many, many years before the coming of the ultimate Emmanuel, who would be the answer, not only for Jews, but for all the people groups of the earth. 
But Isaiah is ready for a good answer right now. Are you able to appreciate that? We want this good answer to come in a very timely fashion right now to our prayers. Sometimes we need to keep on praying and recognize the way God is going to answer those prayers might be quite different than what we ourselves expect. That's the first part of this passage. Now I want to go forward on this and talk about spiritual stability through the word of the Lord. In the rest of Isaiah 8, there's a contrast between what the ungodly are saying in the promised land and what the godly really need to listen to. So Isaiah is given this privilege now of speaking to his children, those who are in his prophetic group, and to pass on to these children now the good word of the Lord. That's a father's job, a father and a mother to train them up in the way of the Lord. Also, with all those that we have influence over, we have this opportunity to train them up, certainly for Isaiah. He's a preacher, and he's got children, as it were, in this congregation of those who listen to the voice of the prophet. So God instructs Isaiah so that Isaiah can instruct these children. And this is what God says. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear. In every generation, there are conspiracy theorists. There are ungodly people of all kinds of opinions who send forth their proclamations and they have their advice. They urge you to take on yourself the fears that they have and then they also urge upon you to follow in their strategy that they have determined in order to fight those fears. But God says, don't listen to the ungodly. When you have such a need for the voice of the Lord, pay attention to what? To the testimony, the testimony of God. And so Isaiah then says, that he's going to seal up this testimony that God has given to it to him among the disciples, among these children. Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord. I will teach these children to wait for the Lord. He says, behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Very interesting that this verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. Listen to this. I'm going to read it. It's instructive for us. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. So the author here is distinguishing between the Old Testament message, which was very serious, it needed to be listened to, and the New Testament message, which is all the more serious, as the word of the Son who has come, he continues, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit dis distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, 
namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Who is this everyone? He goes on to say, and this is where he quotes from Isaiah. Not all the ungodly in Israel would be in the everyone, but the ones who are actually the disciples of the prophet, listening to the word of the Lord. We go on in Hebrews. For it, is, it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, Jesus, in making many sons to glory, bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So God has made Jesus perfect through suffering, and now we also are being perfected through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Well, that's our verse from Isaiah 8. So let's bring that back down and say, now see, here we are. We, by the word of Hebrews chapter 2 are the very ones that are being spoken to here. We are the brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the children of God our Father. We are in the same discipleship group as the prophets of old and as the faithful apostles of the New Testament. We are the church of Jesus Christ and we need to listen to those who bring light and life we are then to be signs and portents as Old Testament Israel was to the people in their midst. This is what we hear back in Isaiah 8. There to be signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So did everybody believe in Israel? No, they did not. Was everyone godly in Old Testament Israel in the days of Isaiah? Not by a long shot. There were many, many ungodly people. What was the advice that the ungodly gave? Because some of them were quite spiritual. What was their advice through this difficult moment? Inquire of the mediums. You know what a medium is? Someone doing sorcery of some kind, trying to delve into spiritual realms, not using the word of the Lord, but going against the express commandments. Inquire of the mediums. And the necromancers, what's a necromancer? Someone, someone trying to get into contact with the dead. See, people are desperate for answers. They want information and they want action. They want things right now. Even Isaiah was desperate. All he heard was, you know, the, this was the land of Emmanuel. And he was ready to run with that and say, okay, all our problems are gone. We have Emmanuel. God is with us. God says, not so fast, not so fast. Listen. Here's godly advice to the teaching and to the testimony. That's what we need. See, yes, we'll suffer. Yes, we'll face inconveniences and far worse than mere inconveniences. But through it all, we will have the word of the Almighty carrying us through this challenging world we live in. So to the teaching and the testimony, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 32. He says this as he's departing from their presence. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. That's just in line with what Isaiah is saying in his day, according to the word of the Lord. So the point of this passage is this ultimate triumph ultimate triumph only comes from communion with the son of god we want answers we want them now we want action right now what we need to set our hearts upon is the son of god and the ultimate triumph that he has for us and then to have communion with him to follow him to stay close to him and that means staying close 
to those who are also close to him. So I want to make an application from this. It, I'm going to do it in two parts, but it's really just one application. And here's the first part of it. Are you looking to the dead for life? You think, what in the world does that even mean? Do you think that I'm some kind of person that goes to a necromancer and you know, wants to try and understand words of knowledge from people that are dead? No, I, I suppose that that's not really the situation that you're facing right now. Maybe, in fact, some of you have been tempted to do that. To think of, if I can't get answers from God, maybe I can go to someone else and I can get spiritual answers in other realms. That's not a, a, a temptation that's unknown among the church, but God strictly prohibits any such thing for us. But what I'm really talking about when I talk about are you looking to the dead for life, I'm talking about the spiritually dead. You see, there are many voices in our media-saturated world, in our celebrity-driven world, where we hear voices, and they're barely connected to a body as far as we're concerned. They're just something that comes off of a screen toward us. We don't really know this person. We don't get a chance to see what they're all about. But their voices come upon, upon us, and they tell us about fear, and they tell us what their plan is in order to have a good strategic direction out of that fear. Maybe it's not the media. Maybe it's something a little closer to home. Friendships, people that maybe you've had as lifelong friends, and you, you thank God for them, and I thank God for many, many friends I have, or even family members. Yet, we have to honestly ask ourselves, are these voices that have such a powerful impact on our soul, are they actually alive? We hear from Paul that before we have faith in Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Are these people we tend to listen to so much, are they blind guides? They may be quite religious, but are they blind guides? Some of you have been studying James, looking at works and faith. And you know what the Lord Jesus Christ says. It's much in line with what James is saying. That don't go for anything that claims to be faith that actually does not proceed in evidence of true godly works. This is the way Jesus puts it. By their fruits you will know them. So on to the second half of really my one application. To the teaching and the testimony. That was the word. That was the word that was given in Isaiah 8, to the teaching and the testimony. But how do we know true teachers of the scriptures, the true children of God? Is it enough that they quote passages from the Bible? No, we have to demand something more than that if we're going to be shepherded by them. See, this is really what we're talking about today. Who are your shepherds in life? Is it possible that you're being shepherded by a voice in the media? You really don't know this person. Is it possible that your friends and family have had more in an impact of an impact on you than you're willing to acknowledge? Listen, to the teaching and to the testimony. So what we're looking for here is, yes, scriptural integrity in order to see who the true children of God are. See, we, we want to see that the person is actually proclaiming what the scriptures say. As an example of this, this week I've been working in Revelation. And in, the, in Revelation 8, we hear about the seventh seal, and it talks about 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Well, people of all kinds of spiritually absurd opinions have decided to tell us what that 30 minutes of silence is all about. They've interpreted what God has concealed. Watch out for those kind of advisors. So no, we're looking for something more than this. Last week I talked about thin righteousness, when people just want you to display your righteousness by being in league with them and being on the right team. It's also a very self-righteous thing that can happen. But we need fat righteousness. Do you have fat righteousness where you're able to say, no, I want a full-bodied righteousness, not some skinny mini righteousness that's just about oh, saying, oh, yeah, I'm on board, I, I like that. But the kind of small steps that Dave Herod was talking about 
in terms of actually confronting the anger of our mind and our heart that would lead us in the direction towards murder, and instead building up one another in love, having patience and gentleness with one another, working toward life. So we need to see signs of a living communion with the Almighty among those who would be our shepherds. So who are your real life advisors? Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. That's in John 10, 27. But who are the people that are with you as you hear the voice of Jesus from the scriptures? Which of the elders in this church or which of the other leading spiritual men or women in this congregation do you trust to shepherd you. Pause. Think about that. If your answer is that you really don't trust anybody here, I think you ought to take another look. We're blessed with godly men, women in this congregation that can be reliable people to help us as we hear the voice of our good shepherd. Brothers and sisters, Let's that, let this then be our one application. Look, in the days of Isaiah, God had appointed Isaiah that he might have children that would listen to the voice of the Lord. Those people that were sons of the prophets, they were also useful in making other disciples. And the same is true of the New Testament era. We start with Jesus and with the 11 remaining disciples, we add on the Apostle Paul, and then throughout the church, we've had such a multiplication of excellent disciples, all of them flawed, all of them sinners, all of them forgiven by the grace of the Almighty. So this is the plan of, of Christ, the exalted Christ. He's given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, elders, leading men and women, so that you would not be left utterly alone in a strange world where you need someone to help you with direction toward the king. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your church and for the ministry of the church. And we pray, Father, that we would be grateful for this good gift that you've given us in Exeter Presbyterian and other churches that we've been engaged in where we're not alone. Father, help us then together to walk in the way that true disciples would walk by the grace of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we look at hymn 404 as a way of response. It's, it's a wonderful hymn for us. The church is one foundation. Let's sing that together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one for all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend. 
to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her and fall sons in her pale, against both foe and traitor she ever shall prevail. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. Well, brothers and sisters, we have this privilege of of having the opportunity to advise others and to receive advice from others. Today we heard some great words from Dave Herod. I was able to take that and to make an application regarding racism. Uh, I was also able to meet with Brian Cook in Korea and with another student from the academy who came from Ghana and who lives in Chicago. Together, last Saturday morning we got together on Zoom and we were able to talk about racism from a biblical standpoint. We were able to connect it with the fifth commandment, the very one that Dave talked about today and wrote about, thou shalt not murder. See, the demeaning of people because of their people group, to bring them down to something that's just an object, something that's less than a person, that is not God's way. In many of our churches, we have a heritage that included this demeaning. We repent of all of that, and now we want to be among people that can help us to see. Look, when I'm involved in racism, I'm violating the fifth commandment. It's an act of murder. That's a good way for us to look at this. Because when we bring it back, back to the fifth commandment, we know, look, I have violated that commandment. Just as Dave wrote about today. I have violated that commandment. So the way for us now is to be united in the body of Christ with good advisors that can help us forward in the Christian faith. And so together we confess our faith using the Nicene Creed here today, used for many generations by people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Hear these good words. We believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us, and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, amen. I am going to deliver to you very soon a benediction. Normally, if we were all together, we would then be able to enjoy some conversation, to have some greetings. 
Maybe you know of someone you would normally have a greeting with and, and you can't do that right now. You know you couldn't. Maybe you can greet others in your family if they're there with you, but you can't have the same snack that you used to have and enjoy time together. So I want to just suggest this to you and in the interest of this community of faith where we have good shepherds that are desirous of, of being in contact with you and helping you, how about doing this? If you can write an email, write an email, or maybe put a note in the mail. Think of anyone you wish in the church that you might want to encourage today. Send them something. I want to hear from people that they got a note, you know, that other people were listening and they did what Pastor Steve said and they sent this note to people. I'd like to hear that many, many people did that. And then once you develop that, uh, you know, you have the courage to do that once, develop a habit of it as, as well so that we can help one another as we walk together through this life. Now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday and a fantastic week.